Brunette, dark skin, blonde hair, long legs, black hair, blue eyes. Our individual looks are down to our genes. Karen and Cheryl are non-identical twins, but there's one striking difference. Karen is dark with brown eyes, and Cheryl is fair with blue eyes. I think I look more like my dad than my mum, because I've got the same colour eyes as my dad. My dad's Jamaican, my mum's English. My hair is um, a bit curly around the top. I think I got that from my dad, as he has really curly afro hair. My hair is sometimes springy, but when I brush it, it goes all frizzy. Um, my hair is lighter than my dad's, but only just. I think I look like my granddad rather than anyone else. Mainly because he had blonde hair, while anyone else in my family's got dark hair. Um, and he had blue eyes, while everyone had dark eyes. Why does Karen have dark hair and Cheryl have fair hair? We are all made up from a cocktail of genes inherited from our parents. When our mother's egg and our father's sperm fuse, the first cell of life is formed. It is at this point our characteristics are determined. The cell starts to divide and multiply to produce millions of cells. Every cell of our body has a nucleus, and every nucleus contains 23 pairs of chromosomes. These chromosomes carry the genes that give us our characteristics, from the colour of our eyes to the colour of our hair. Both our parents carry two genes for every characteristic, but we inherit one gene from our father and one gene from our mother. This gives us our two genes for every characteristic. If we inherit a dark hair gene from our father and a dark hair gene from our mother, we will have dark hair. If we inherit a dark hair gene from our father and a fair hair gene from our mother, we will have dark hair. This is because dark hair is a dominant gene and fair hair is a recessive gene. So, the dark hair gene overrules the fair hair gene. Karen and Cheryl's mother carries a gene for dark hair and a gene for fair hair. She probably inherited her fair hair gene from her father. Likewise, the twins' father has a dark hair gene and a fair hair gene, which he inherited from his parents. Karen inherited at least one dark hair gene because dark hair is dominant. Cheryl must have inherited two fair hair genes, as the only way you can be fair haired is to have two fair hair genes. Girls will be girls, and boys will be boys. What makes a baby a boy or a girl is determined as the first cell of life is forming, as our parents' sex cells are getting it together. What makes a girl a girl are her two X chromosomes, and what makes a boy a boy is his X and Y chromosomes. So how is our sex determined? A man's sperm has 23 chromosomes, and so does the woman's egg. Out of these 23 pairs of chromosomes are two sex-determining chromosomes. The woman's egg always carries an X chromosome, while the man's sperm can carry an X or Y chromosome. When a man passes his X chromosome to combine with the woman's X chromosome, they will have a girl. When a man passes his Y chromosome to combine with the woman's X chromosome, they will have a boy. It's not just characteristics and sex we inherit from our parents. Sometimes we can inherit disease. Hemophilia is a genetically inherited blood disorder where blood does not clot properly. The slightest bruise or cut can cause bleeding and can be fatal. Hemophilia is a sex-linked disease because the gene for hemophilia is carried on the X chromosome. This makes women carriers, but men suffer from the disease.
Rawlass, hit by hemophilia. Sex scandal rocks Buckingham Palace. The rumping royals, dishing the dirt on the dashing duchess. Love triangle. Queen of Hearts. Who was Queen Victoria's real father? It's a scandal. There's a new scandal rocking Buckingham Palace, but this time it's got nothing to do with the Windsor family. Nope, I'm going back about 100 years or so to the good old days of Queen Victoria and her children to get the scoop on this particular fishy story. Haemophilia is a disease that means your blood can't clot properly. Queen Victoria carried the haemophilia gene, but she didn't show any of its symptoms, nor did her two daughters. One of her sons, however, showed symptoms of haemophilia. Nah. Queen Victoria carried the haemophilia gene on one of her X chromosomes. Her daughters inherited the haemophilia gene when they inherited her X chromosome. The girls did not suffer from the disease, as their other X chromosome protected them. Queen Victoria passed the haemophilia gene to her son when he inherited her X chromosome. The boy suffered from the disease because boys have got only one X chromosome, which they inherit from their mother. Their Y chromosome is smaller than the X chromosome, so it does not offer the same protection. If a man with haemophilia has daughters, they will be carriers, as they inherit the haemophilia gene from his X chromosome. But boys are free of the disease, as they don't inherit the father's X chromosome. They inherit his Y chromosome instead. So, where did the haemophilia gene come from? Well, maybe it was Queen Victoria's mom and dad. Or maybe, and this is really juicy, some people reckon Queen Victoria's mom had a lover. Who knows? All these questions need answers, and to get them, I've got to start with the most important question of all. Who was Queen Victoria's real dad? Hi, Vanessa. Oh, hi. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Very well. Smashing. Now, you're the scientist who's going to help me out with my scoop. Is that right? I hope so. Good. Well, I've got you some flowers. Oh, thank you. You're such a Romeo. Oh, thank you very much. Well, you know, it's beautiful surroundings. I had to start the moment off properly. Now then, I've got a great story, but I've got to establish some facts. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, Queen Victoria's dad, was he her real dad? Well, I've got some ideas about this. Fancy game of chess? Sounds great to me. Okay. First thing to consider is her children, because three of her children were carriers of the haemophilia gene. So she had two daughters who were carriers and a son. And let's say this rose represents the gene for haemophilia. Yes. I'm going to put that oh, on that. Smashing. Part. And because so many of her children were carriers of the haemophilia gene, yeah. Queen Victoria must have been a carrier too. All right. So let's, let's get say, Queenie out. Yeah, let's get Queenie out. So we've got our two daughters, both carriers, we've got the son who has got the symptoms, and we've got Queen Vic, who we've deduced, must also be a carrier. Okay, pop it so in the So she must have been a carrier. And the question is, which one of her parents over here gave her the gene? This is her mother, the Duchess of Kent, and her father, the Duke of Kent. Well, we know that there's no haemophilia in her family. Uh -huh. There's no evidence for it. And she had a couple of children by a previous marriage. Should we get those out? Yep. Okay, so these represent her children. Her children. Yep. And there's no history of haemophilia in them either. So what about the Duke of Kent? What's his story? Well, we know there's no haemophilia in his family either. Yeah. So... Well, that's not very interesting. I'm looking for a scoop, Vanessa. What can you give me? Some juice? Well, he did have a mistress for 27 years. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Can I get her out? Yep. Here she is. This is the mistress. Well, they were together 27 years before he married the Duchess. OK. And they didn't have any children. So it's quite possible that one of them was sterile. Either he was sterile or she was sterile. But a much more likely theory is mutation. Vanessa, you've lost me now. I was with you before, and now you've lost me. What's mutation? Well, mutation is quite simply an error when new copies of genes are made. So, for instance, if you, when you have a new cell made in the body, uh, there's a new copy of all the genetic information inside each cell. OK. So if you have a, a new sperm cell or egg cell made, and there's an error when they're made, then this could lead to a new disease in the next generation. Which, in this case, is haemophilia. Yeah. I think I'm going to say it's a little bit like a typing error, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit like that. You type out QWERTY seven times, you get it wrong, you write SQUIRTY. Something like that, yeah. OK, Vanessa, where's all this leading to? Well, 
25% of all haemophilia cases are in fact due to mutation, which means that in Queen Victoria's case, it was either a mutation in her mother's egg cell or her father's sperm cell. But because he was 51 when she was conceived, a good 20 years older than her mother, it's much more likely the mutation occurred in him. And I guess that like most men, he produced millions of sperms in a lifetime, and therefore the chance of a copying error in him is more likely than in a woman. Absolutely. Well, that leads me to my next point. And we still haven't cleared this one up. What about Queen Victoria's mother taking a lover? Like this smashing looking chap over here. Let's get them together. Quick cuddle. There you are. Quick hug. Easy. There you go. Well, we certainly know the Duchess and Duke's marriage wasn't a love match. And if she did have a secret liaison, he would probably wouldn't have been the dashing lover that you might imagine. Because in those days without treatment, he probably would have been quite ill. Uh, so I don't expect it to be. Nope. Not very likely, but not completely out of the question. So if you don't mind, Vanessa, I'll bring him back into the picture. Well, it, it is possible that he, she did have a lover, but uh, he's a complete mystery and we'll never know. Vanessa, thanks a lot. Allow me to sum up. Now then, we know that Queen Victoria's mum and dad, the Duchess and Duke of Kent, showed no signs of haemophilia. But it could have been the result of a mutation in the mother's eggs or indeed the father of the Duke's sperm. I should just mention this lady over here, the Duke's mistress that he had before marrying the Duchess for 27 years, and all that time these two had no children, either the result of sterility in the lover or indeed the Duke himself, fire and blanks. But I tell you where I reckon all this scoop started, over here with the Duchess and her mystery lover. That's the man we have to blame. No, no, Jason, I mean, if you want to make a scandal out of this, Nate, that's probably the way I'd sum it up. But I think in this case it's much more likely to have been a natural mutation and most likely to have happened in the Duke's sperm. All right, what do you say to that, Queenie? We are not amused. Thalassemia is another genetically inherited disease. It's a blood disorder caused by a lack of hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Hemoglobin is vital to our survival because it carries oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body. <laughs> These are normal red blood cells which contain hemoglobin. These are thalassemia blood cells that are smaller and contain less hemoglobin. So people with thalassemia need to have regular blood transfusions. Basically they have to give me blood every three weeks without it. And I, like, if I come a week late or something, I become to grow weak, I go pale and you can see I can't even walk down the, like, down the street without getting tired and getting pain in my back. This evening's Big Bash is to promote awareness and raise money for the Thalassemia Society. The Society strives to support people in understanding the disease. In Britain, over 200,000 people, mainly of Mediterranean and Asian origin, carry the gene for thalassemia. Thalassemia is perhaps the most important inherited disorder amongst the Asian community that we have now in the UK. If you talk in terms of all racial groups, it is perhaps the most important inherited disorder. It is far more common than cystic fibrosis and also sickle cell disease. So how do we inherit thalassemia? If one parent carries the gene for thalassemia and the other doesn't, there's a 50-50 chance of having either a child that's a carrier or a child free of thalassemia. If both parents carry the gene for thalassemia, there's a 25% chance the child will have normal blood. A 50% chance the child will carry the gene. Or a 25% chance that the child will actually suffer from the disease. I'm labelled as the ill one, or I'm labelled as, um, oh, but he's thalassemic, you can't marry him, what about kids, and he's going to die, and all this kind of stuff. So there's still a lot of prejudices, a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. I've been through a broken marriage, basically, because of thalassemia, and, like, the in-laws, the same as Michael, not understanding as such. But, um, 
I think I've been allowed to progress, really. I'm, I think I'm really lucky with my parents. I've always adopted a positive outlook on life, and I've accommodated thalassemia into my life. I haven't let it interfere with me, but it can be hard at times. But it is possible to reduce the number of babies born with this disease. To do this, you have to first screen the parents to find out if they are both carriers. One of the most successful screening programs to prevent thalassemia has been on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, where one in six people carry the gene for thalassemia. The screening program was set up with the full backing of the church. Why has it been so successful? Most Greek Cypriot couples get married in church, but the church won't marry them unless they have a blood test for thalassemia. The main condition to issue a license is for the couple who are interested to get married in the church to uh, present a certificate that they have passed the necessary test for thalassemia. It proved whether they are carriers of the disease or not carriers. By doing this, nearly all couples having babies in the Republic of Cyprus were screened for thalassemia. But the dilemma with screening, whether it's in Cyprus or Britain, is that if the couple are both carriers, they may have to face an abortion. Science has given couples the choice, but making that decision is probably the toughest they'll ever have to make. I had to make that decision, and I made that decision to have a termination because to have a baby with thalassemia major, I don't think it's really fair to give, give birth to that child. The Lacanis now have a healthy, bouncing baby boy. When I was born, it was the most amazing feeling when we saw him and to know what we've been through to get today and just just the sight of him was like we both had tears in our eyes it was just an amazing feeling something that we really wanted and we got we have a son he's 15 and a half years of age his name is vasos and he suffers from thalassemia major i didn't want to abort my child for many personal reasons two of them being one it was my first child and secondly, I disagree with abortion personally, but that's not to say when a child, when you are screened for thalassemia, if you discover that it is. For me, I didn't feel it was the right thing for me to do. Then Vasos came and, uh, and I will never regret that decision for the rest of my living days. Scientists are exploring new ways of dealing with genetically inherited diseases. One is gene therapy. The idea is to insert a normal gene into the patient. In the case of thalassemia, the patient will be able to make normal red blood cells. This could mean the end of parents facing dilemmas like abortion. The real hope is for an ultimate cure. <laughs>